if we can see the image of society not as a river but like a, a rhizome which mm -hmm. is kind of any point can connect to any other point it gives us more freedom to move also and uh, yeah a lot of uh, artistic and aesthetic freedom as well Hi Marzu folks, this is Alina. Welcome to another new interview on a very special subject, social sculpture as an art form. Today my guest is Janavi Tamankar, who is an Indian dancer and artistic researcher. Janavi is trained as an DC dancer. She has undergone 15 years at Mahagami Sangeet Academy in India. Janeve performs solo and she has performed in the United Arab Emirates, in India, in Denmark, Austria and many other countries worldwide. Janeve studied philosophy in Belgium and she was doing research uh, in residence at Oxford Brookes University. She has presented at conferences and published papers around the world and is currently pursuing her Dr. Artyom degree at the University of Music and Performing Arts, Graz. Hi, Janavi. Welcome and thank you so much for agreeing for this talk with me today. Oh, hi. Thank you um, to you for this opportunity because it gives me um, a chance to also clarify my own thoughts and um, yeah, it's always easier when you're speaking about it or teaching somebody else that you uh, learn about the issue better yourself. So Definitely. thank you very much. <laughs> Definitely. I'm so glad. So my first question is that how your dance practice as a performing artist, how did it lead to what you're doing now, to the social sculpture? <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's a kind of longish journey with a lot of detours, but um, so I've, uh, like you said earlier, I've, I've been trained in Indian Classical Dance Odyssey uh, for 15 more or more years. And um, this is a very rigorous kind of training where you also learn um, uh, the music and the lights and every aspect of the perf stage performance, mm -hmm. um, the text that goes along with it. Um, and this, uh, but to me, it also feels a little bit like um, I love the dance form a lot, but I, to me it also feels a little bit like <clears throat> um, I can't reach everyone with this art form because it's codified, it's like a code of codified stylized language mm -hmm. uh, and people who understand it will come to see your performances um, and I can't reach those who don't understand the language. So. Um, I always felt like this is, uh, I can't reach everyone with this, but um, also uh, my other background, academic background has been philosophy and um, for a long time it also felt like I was leading these two separate lifestyles, one in this, um, in the Gurukul in my uh, dance academy, um, where it was thinking about dance, eating, breathing dance all day. And then it was when I was back home in my city, I was doing philosophy, which was like theoretical um, analysis and mm -hmm. argumentation. And I enjoyed both a lot, uh, but somewhere it felt like they split up this, mm -hmm. but it's me, the same person who's doing both. So they have to come together somehow. And then I was, I applied on a whim to a um, summer school in Weimar in Germany. Uh, I think about 15 years ago now uh, and this was a summer school in social sculpture uh, it was called from Bauhaus to social sculpture shaping humane society as an aesthetic challenge and from the title I didn't understand anything <laughs> <laughs> um, I had never heard of social sculpture um, but I was like, okay, uh, I had been for an exchange program in Germany and I loved Germany a lot. So mm -hmm. I was like, if it gives me a chance to go back to Germany, I would love this. 
and totally learn something new and I just kind of harped on the word aesthetic in this title hmm. and I was like okay that I understand and maybe that that is somewhere I can link with this and luckily I got selected I also got a scholarship to go for it wow. and so um, I think that was a big turning point in my life because this um, was in Weimar for uh, two weeks and uh, it was a residential program and with just uh, 10 people and the course tutors were Shelley Sachs and Hildegard Court and um, there I got introduced to the basic concepts of social sculpture, the, uh, a few, we read a few texts together, we also went to the Bauhaus um, uh, University and learned about the, the masters, uh, the Bauhaus masters and their ideas of form and uh, dealing with materials and so it was also kind of an introduction to me to Western art in a way, like to mm -hmm. Kandinsky, Paul, Paul Clay and all of these people, um, to understand how the West understands the, let's say, painting or um, yeah, different art forms. Uh, so it was actually a broadening for me in many ways. But also uh, I finally thought that this is somewhere where these two split personalities of mine with dance and philosophy can actually merge because uh, social sculpture is kind of a practice-based methodology mm -hmm. uh, but it is also um, it has a basis in um, of course philosophy anthroposophy all of these other traditions as well so for me it was actually helpful to come from philosophy and dance to social sculpture as well to have a different take on it and um, I f found that I can finally merge these two um, dimensions of myself in in the social sculpture arena somehow um, and yeah from there then I decided after that I still did my MPhil in Belgium uh, in philosophy uh, where I then focused on aesthetics uh, mainly uh, working with the uh, dynamic between a performer, a dancer and her audience during a performance. So what mm -hmm. happens during a live performance? How is this process uh, going on? Um, and there I kind of harped on this concept of empathy, which is what is actually the exchange is all about. Uh, and that's what I'm carrying forward now in my doctorate, uh, mm -hmm. the empathy research. Um, but yeah, that's where it all began in Weimar. And, um, it's also very funny because now, after so many years, uh, one of my friends that I met there, um, Lara, Lara Kruger uh, as she is in South Africa and we've never met after that Weimar, um, uh, the summer school, but she and I are actually now presenting at a conference in December. In South together. Africa. Yes, uh, we were wow. hoping it would be in person, but because of COVID it's not, it's online. But yeah, we are uh, we finally are doing something together, working with ideas that we learned there in Weimar, and we took them in our own journeys. Her practice is drawing, mm -hmm. uh, so she has taken it in a different way, and now we are kind of also checking back in with our practices and what's happening in our uh, professional uh, lives. Yeah, and we're making a conference contribution out of this, so it's quite exciting um, as well. <laughs> this is amazing. So it is a joint contribution. Yes. Are you sharing your practices? Are you doing something intertwined? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, we have written a score uh, of a, a few questions, mm -hmm. uh, with which we also invite the audience to come explore along with us. Uh, but we are exploring them as well. Mm -hmm. So we've made a short vi uh, video clip for each question, uh, which we are juxtaposing next to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, her with her drawing and me with my dance, slash whatever my practice is. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it's, uh, we, we have a 10 minute kind of video on contribution. Excellent. So, this is amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and best of luck, of course, yeah, in December. Thanks. Janavi, let's step 
half a step back, okay? Mm -hmm. What is social sculpture? Because yeah. I'm sure it's not very widely known yet to a lot of audiences there. Artists mm -hmm. out there, for example, I as an artist with, with experience of my entire life and performance, mm -hmm. I have learned about social sculpture last year when I met mm -hmm. you. And I have been wondering since then to, to find out more about it. Mm -hmm. So could you please share yes, some, sure. some basics? So how, how, sorry, how does it differ uh, from the social science? Because that's probably yeah, okay. the closest one would think, yeah. right? Uh, okay, so social sculpture in German is called soziale plastik. Uh -huh. uh, so that's where this sculpture... So when you understand the two languages, you can understand this better. Mm -hmm. Because the, also, I mean, in English, when you say the plasticity of things, it means this kind of quality of things that to uh, that enables us to mold them and shape them differently mm -hmm. and that's exactly what sculpture is also doing uh, through different techniques but uh, it's kind of sculpture is understood as the shaping mechanism of society <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's why the social sculpture but um, of course this was uh, coined the term social plastic is uh, coined by Joseph Beuys uh, in Germany um, after the Second World War, which he was also a part of, and there's a big legend about his story as well, um, uh, which, I mean, it's it's everywhere on the internet, there are books about it as well, but it's mainly um, that he uh, he was a pilot, and then he uh, his uh, plane crashed, uh, and he was his co-pilot, I think, uh, couldn't make it, but he, uh, Joseph Boyce, was actually found uh, in the snow by uh, Tatars. Um, these, um, I think it's a Russian. Ah, Tatars. Tatars, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it. So they, and they apparently wrapped him in felt mm -hmm. and fat, and that's how they nursed him back to health. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm cutting st short the story yeah. a lot, there's um, more details in it. Um, but uh, so these substances also kind of come forward in his work a lot, like fat and felt. Um, a lot of people say this is just a legend he's made up about mm -hmm. his own life to, to deal with the trauma of what happened. Um, but, well, this is the story that has come ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, he, um, he believed that every human being is an artist and uh, this is also one of his quotes and uh, if we be so because every human being is an artist because everyone possesses the capacities for imagination and reflection and if we go about doing whatever we do in society with this awareness um, what we do becomes a social sculpture so the idea has uh, actually little to do with sculpture per se like the traditional um, uh, art form of sculpture, but it's more about how we choose to shape our society around us. Mm -hmm. And that is why it's called social sculpture. Uh, my understanding of social sculpture comes from whatever I've read about uh, boys, but also his student Shelley Sachs, who I did the summer school with and who uh, was the head of the research unit in Oxford Brooks, mm -hmm. where I did the residency. and. Um, her work differs a little bit from Boy's. Um, so Boy's also had this uh, kind of very... Um, well, because he borrows a lot from anthroposophy, uh, mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner, and um, he his work has a lot of uh, connection with the spiritual, the occult, the mythical, um, and he also uses uh, mythology from Christianity and... Um, uh, which is also a big part in anthroposophy. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I am not borrowing all of this from his um, work, the esoteric kind of uh, mm -hmm. understanding or approach from it. Um, uh, so, a lot of his works are actually about connecting to being, understanding that humanity is on a threshold where now it has to seek a connection beyond and what is this beyond? One option is this is the spiritual realm, 
and how do we do this is through social sculpture. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the uh, ways. Um, so he he used a lot of materials like fat and uh, felt, um, uh, ra uh, rabbit's hair, mm -hmm. uh, so um, or a rose or honey. Honey was a big uh, uh, material that he used, a substance, and he. Uh, I think his choice of materials was basically uh, to understand that uh, everything is in flux and it changes. Mm -hmm. uh, so every time you stand in front of one of the installations, there is an internal process going on with the substance itself, but mm -hmm. also of you, which then prompts you to undergo an inner transformation as well. So it's always very difficult to talk about social sculpture because it seems very vague and abstract. Um, but maybe I can give you some an example. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of his most famous uh, works is uh, the honey pump at the workplace, uh, which he presented at the Documenta in Kassel um, for 100 days. And it was for direct democracy. So there was a huge uh, apparatus that he built um, and uh, there were two engines with a pipe which um, and a big blob of uh, margarine as fat mm -hmm. helped to keep the engines going. And then there were the, the honey was sucked up into the room uh, on, I think, another floor. And then it would go like it was on the wall and it would kind of circle two, three times in the pipe and then go back into the pump. And this would happen through, wow. through the day. Um, but the idea was uh, that making honey is, uh, is an art form mm -hmm. that bees actually spend a lot of effort doing and how can we make social honey in a way. Um, so the, the room itself had people, whoever was interested to come and talk about direct democracy and um, this was kind of a provocation to start. Mm -hmm. speaking about issues about democracy. Um, another example which I think makes it more clearer is uh, from Shelley's work. Um, it's called Exchange Values um, and it's uh, or the banana project and it is about uh, she uses banana skins mm -hmm. uh, which she gathered over a long time and uh, she realized that she doesn't know where these banana skin the bananas she's eating in the UK come from. Um, the the box has some number stamped on it, but what mm -hmm. does this number mean? So she found, she asked people and she found out that it refers to a farmer, a specific farmer's a farmer in South America. Mm -hmm. So she went there and she, uh, obviously they thought this is a white woman who's come to kind of, you know, teach us how to do things better. Um, but uh, she approached them saying, you know, um, I think all of you are artists and I'm also an artist and I just want to learn your process. Hmm. And this kind of shifted something and they uh, welcomed her and then she was able to actually um, uh, make a, a work out of this in the UK where she offered, on the pavement she offered people bananas mm -hmm. and uh, with a s small sign which read one banana in return for your skin. So it meant the banana skin, but mm -hmm. it got people talking about <laughs> what does this mean, you know, like, so, so it started a conversation on the pavement somehow. Um, and this also then she collected a lot of these banana uh, peels and she treated them and she um, wove, uh, she stitched them together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to kind of form uh, something like a painting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then these were uh, hung like a gallery uh -huh. um, uh, exhibition but each of the um, yeah well the sheets of banana skin mm -hmm. have a box underneath it with the stamp of the number of the farmer who's okay. produced this box and people can actually listen to their voice so it also has a pair of headphones and you can look at the banana skin as you look at a painting. 
but you also hear the voice of a farmer who's actually grown this. Wow. So it it was a way of connecting people in the UK mm-hmm. to the farmers who are producing their food and then to start a dialogue about fair trade. Um and how is this um uh, uh the economy of this running and what are the problems in it and uh yeah, so that's kind of a a uh, long <laughs> uh, example um yeah but i think this one kind of makes it clear that the impulse of social culture is to actually choose how we relate to others or how how aware we choose to be about um things going on around us mm-hmm. um yeah so interconnecting humanity and pretty much relating to to the population is the material to shape up your own uh, attitudes, let's say, yes. towards the world. This yes. is mind-blowing. <laughs> this is really... Uh, oh, wow. Thank yeah, thanks so for saying for this insight. word, attitudes, because yes, the actual material, so of course you use, uh, you use a cloth or you use banana skins or you use, uh, for example, I use writing or drawing and movement. But these are devices, kind yes. of tools. Maybe, yes, yeah? but the actual materials are um, what's happening with the thought processes. Mm-hmm. So the... Mm-hmm. There are tangible materials and then intangible materials. Right. So, which is actually where the main work happens. Um, uh, at least that's how I understand social sculpture, where we are trying to uh, make a shift in our perception, mm-hmm. uh, in our attitudes, habits, beliefs, uh, values, um, and how do we... Um, yeah, just to reflect for ourselves about what is this framework for us. But also, what is this framework for another person? And so, where is this coming from? Uh, so, we're always very uh, ready to judge. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, I think the, the practices like these uh, give us time to actually pause, which is very difficult in today's life, uh, lifestyle, uh, to pause and to really reflect on uh, what is really happening and how do I want to proceed with this um, issue for myself but also for others, for people like let's say in my neighborhood or uh, even my spouse, my family, what is, uh, how do I want to make these uh, connections and how, how do we maintain these. So like I said for boys it was more also about connecting to the other world Mm-hmm. Or he believed like his um, uh, urge was to also um, speak about a different kind of subjectivity, not just human subjectivity, but also animal subjectivity. So mm-hmm. uh, there's also a work of his called Explaining Painting to uh, Dead Hair. So he's trying to evoke a different kind of subjectivity of, a, of an animal of how an animal would look at paintings, mm. uh, perhaps. So, so that was his, um, let's say, kind of agenda. Uh, for Shelley, it is, uh, as far as I understand her work, it is also about um, how do we uh, shape and sustain um, an ecologically viable society. So she also works a lot with uh, climate change um, and uh, yeah, uh, animal um, rights and so more like about the environmental uh, issues as well. Uh, for me, I'm focusing on, uh, on human interactions. Mm-hmm. So I'm just starting out in the field and I think it's... Um, a small enough but crucial, important place to start. Um, so I'm, I'm talking. Of course, they also work on this, but I'm only focusing on this without mm-hmm. the ecological or sustainability um, picture in in mind yet. Okay, so <laughs> let's let's move to the next step. If we now cover the basic ideas of what social sculpture is about. But you are doing your work to promote the change mm-hmm. in the world. I guess that's the <laughs> big purpose, because otherwise, why? Um, 
So, as far as I understood from hearing your presentations and looking at one of your performances, which I was very, very lucky to be present at, um, our mindsets kind of need to shift to, to a certain model that we don't really use. So I remember your juxtaposition of the mainstream and the rise of model mm -hmm. of society, of mm -hmm. treating the society. Can we talk about this? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, we talk about a society as, a, as mainstream society and um, all debates about inclusion and uh, integration, everything talks about including or integrating people in mainstream. So in English, mainstream actually comes from the idea of a river. Uh, and this means that there is one main river which has the tributaries which join the river and then you have the distributaries. So I am using this as an analogy. So of course the word itself is an analogy when it speaks about society, uh, mainstream society that there are all, all, always some distributaries which are kind of marginalized due to either prejudices, bias, whatever it might be, race, gender, or there are a million issues. Um, we always find ways to other people from us. And uh, this, um, so I'm using the mainstream as a, a yeah, as a metaphor uh, where the distributaries become the um, the marginalized communities and uh, they can never flow back into the mainstream. So even if inclusion and integration policies are in place, um, logically if you think about it, um, once that they are separated, it's not possible to uh, bring them back into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So when I got thinking about this, I thought that maybe it's time to change the mainstream itself. So what we talk about the mainstream as one main river uh, is what is creating the problem. So what if we are actually able to have a, a society where not, um, we are, I mean, growing up we, we are conditioned in many ways, right? Like we have like some things that are common to the family, some things that religion teaches us, something that we learn in school. So we, we accumulate a lot of conditionings which are kind of the mainstream model of thinking and um, we tend to stick to these ways of thinking in as we grow up and make decisions for ourselves and sometimes if we, we are in power positions, decisions for other people as well. So I was thinking that if uh, instead of this one main, if we can say that the main the, the model of society is such that it can have many different dimensions and directions instead of just one. Uh, so I, uh, I borrow this uh, concept from uh, the French philosophers Deleuze and Quattari, mm -hmm. uh, where they speak about the rhizome. Uh, they speak about it as a, an alternative to an arboreal or a tree-like model of thinking, which is also hierarchical. Um, and they believe that the rhizome is actually, um, there's no one main, it's always in the middle. And each, so for example, if we take ginger, so I'm taking ginger as my uh, main uh, protagonist, let's say, uh, it's helping me think as well. Um, so ginger is a rhizome. And if you see a piece of ginger, it has many mm, bulges and mm -hmm. nodes. And these are the places where it will seek connections. So each of these can seek very connections in different directions and dimensions and each of them are valid and they mm -hmm. will grow into more pieces of ginger. Uh, so the structure of a rhizome is quite fascinating that way and I feel like uh, it's, um, it's also horizontal, so it's not mm -hmm. vertical. Right. So I think that does something to our thinking as well, uh, where it's like, you know, lateral thinking as they call it where um, each idea is can have this uh, equal importance or validity as mm -hmm. the other um, and also each person can have equal importance and validity as the other. I like this form of the ginger a lot because it also shows that there are a lot of 
points of entry and exit mm-hmm. in this rhizome and mm-hmm. if you break off one part it will still be able to connect mm-hmm. the broken piece can still connect form new connections mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh which is i think in contrast to the distributaries because they cannot form more connections um so if we're talking an in the in the analogy um marginalized communities if um are usually segregated from society and uh, how to integrate them or how to include them is always decided by the mainstream so it's still the mainstream mm-hmm. who kind of pulls the strings and uh, now through my doctoral project what i'm trying to uh, start in a very small way is to actually first understand the the stories of one marginalized community in india which is um, people with leprosy who have been cured but still don't have access to mainstream resources and mm. um society uh, so so to just understand their um uh, relationship with the disease their relationship with their families their relationship with um the outside society so to say from where they live mm-hmm. the where they are segregated mm-hmm. um and th- but i also realized during this work that the wo- uh, the like you said you know the mind shift uh, mindset shift that mm-hmm. needs to happen this is not um applicable to the community the mm-hmm. to the segregated community so the shift that ha- needs to happen in mindset is with the mainstream, mainstream because yeah. they are the ones who are pulling the strings right. and i mean in my model everyone gets a say in how this goes mm-hmm. um and the idea is that if um if we can so this is again now where it links to social sculpture because uh treating every human being as an artist you give them the freedom and responsibility to choose how they connect with each other each uh person uh and each situation so um we we know we have this freedom but we um uh, rarely make decisions from this awareness mm-hmm. um so uh, i also borrow uh, like two two main big terms from um shelley uh shelley sacks which is uh, aesthetic as the opposite of an aesthetic mm-hmm. uh so this kind of turns the word on its head because um usually we understand aesthetic as something relating to artworks um but to to talk of aesthetic in terms of social sculpture means that um to co- if you co- contrast it with something that is anesthetic which so anesthetic is something which numbs or deadens you mm-hmm. and so aesthetic becomes that which enlivens you so if is if it's uh, so that is what um I am also aiming to d- how to do, to design my practices to to offer an experience that enlivens the participants. So what does this enlivening actually mean? Um well empathy can certainly be a part of it because mm-hmm. it helps you understand somebody else better. But also just uh, simply being open and curious and being present for the other person. And the other um concept that i wanted to talk about was responsibility so responsibility but as response ability uh-huh. so okay. this is um, also from shelly and it's uh, uh, understood as the ability to respond uh so usually responsibility is something that you know uh, society parents uh, our teachers or religions they kind of thrust upon us mm-hmm. and we have to then fulfill our roles in these right um uh, uh situations um but if you understand responsibility as the uh, ability to respond uh it suddenly awakens a uh, freedom within us mm-hmm. so it's not like i have to do this in this certain way that is the norm but i can actually choose how to do this you get to do this yes so uh, it's um so in with these two aesthetic and so kind of if we club them together with an aesthetic response ability mm-hmm. if we try to engage with another human being 
the way we shape our interaction completely changes. Um, and it's, it's about aw awakening this kind of awareness in the participants, but also um, yeah, using other methods like listening and uh, active listening also from Shelley and uh, a dialogue method from David Bohm. So these are all kind of um, tools, again, helping to really be open and present um, and choosing how to relate to the other person. So like a piece of ginger actually has an internal logic. It's internally moved to seek for a connection in some direction mm -hmm. and form these uh, new uh, roots or stems and um, where the new ginger can grow. Uh, similarly, if we can see the image of society not as a river but like a, a rhizome which mm -hmm. is kind of any point can connect to any other point, it gives us more freedom to move also and uh, yeah a lot of uh, artistic and aesthetic freedom as well I feel. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So. Janavi, uh, you mentioned the situation in India uh, with the people who were cured from leprosy but they were not um, introduced to yeah. the mainstream. Do you refer to the government as the mainstream? Is this imposed by the government? What is your intake on this and whether you have well, uh, ideally speaking, a, a hypothetical proposition of how to actually integrate the mm -hmm. different social classes and levels mm -hmm. just to interconnect the humanity. Yeah, so that's uh, a very loaded question. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. That's um, why we're here. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, of course, there's no straightforward answer for this, but it's... Um, and with uh, the situation in India, it's always more layered with uh, with caste um, mm -hmm. as well, uh, uh, playing a big role. Um, so there are a lot of inter uh, uh, there's a lot of intersectionality with uh, where. Um, but the case of leprosy is kind of uh, special because leprosy is a disease, but it also causes deformities of the body. So what it does is that it uh, the nerves of the at the edges of the body uh, start decaying, mm -hmm. and so it uh, you lose sensation from the tips to of your body, uh, or so usually the deformities start in and the the flesh basically starts to rot, mm -hmm. and you don't feel it, so you don't know if you hit yourself and then the wound just keeps growing, but you don't feel it, so um, it either from the hands or the feet or the ears or the nose. So it's at any extremities of the body, it starts. Um, and so a lot of people with leprosy, if you see images um, on Google or something, they usually have deformed faces. And then, of course, you lose um, your eyes and things like that. But um, over the years, there has been a lot of awareness that has spread, and um, which is why the people now so, of course, because of this in, in Hindu mythology, in Christian mythology, there has always been um, uh, stories about how um, this uh, section of society was always just kind of left, um, outcast, uh, sent away, um, and then um, somebody kind of saved them. So, Jesus, there are some stories, I believe, which where Jesus um, kind of cured the left, uh, people with leprosy and um, but um, apart from mythology if we were to see the situation then most countries in the world actually it's kind of um, uh, astonishing to see the similarities with COVID because um, mm. it's also a pandemic mm -hmm. which we didn't know a virus which we didn't know much about we still don't know a lot about it um, but imagine this kind of scare many years ago, centuries ago, when science was also not uh, developed much. Um, so, I mean, of course people were scared, but th what it amounted to was that people who got leprosy was uh, were sent, were shipped off in boats away from the mainland on islands where there was nothing. Uh, so it was literally like they were shipped off to, to die there um, without anything. Uh, some places actually develop leprosy colonies, 
where there was mm-hmm. some kind of treatment that was given to them. Um, but these places, so in India also there have been many leprosy colonies, but the problem is that they never had, uh, at that point the idea was to at least give them, reduce their pain in a way, because there was no uh, technology or science that they had a cure. Um, but then when the cure came, it was still um, only to kind of give the cure, but then the leprosy colonies basically left the people who were cured, who had deformities of the hands and face, to, to just beg on the streets. Mm-hmm. So that was their only option of earning a living, That's having so anything cool. to eat. So um, it's... Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of forces at play here. It's not just the government or... Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest uh, problem, again, was the society's mindset towards these people where uh, it's you feel disgusted when you see somebody with such deformities and um, you don't want them. And, of course, instilled by fear, you also have this notion of, oh, now they will spread it. So it's mm-hmm. like COVID where... Mm-hmm. You don't want to be close to a person um, who has it and uh, so you kind of shut out Mm -hmm. these people. Um, With leprosy it was easier than COVID because you could see the Mm -hmm. effects. Um, But the the problem is also that because of these deformities they actually also fall into the category of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. But in the laws they don't fall into this category. How come? Um, because it's not, it's a disease, not a disability. Um, but it is a disease that leads to yes, disability. Yes, but it's, um, so it's it's like what I was explained was that people with leprosy don't get the privileges of people with disabilities, but they also don't get um, kind of, you know, HIV AIDS, uh, which mm-hmm. was also uh, kind of had a similar uh, fate and stigma and everything. Somehow, um, as a disease, it has more glamour in a way. It's wrong to say this, but it's um, it, it got a lot of funding, a lot of impetus to do research, uh, and uh, it's kind of in a better position than leprosy because leprosy was just mm-hmm. never um, considered good enough to... Res- oh. I mean, of course, there have been uh, attempts to find, of course, the cure was found, but uh, what causes it? It's this um, a sp- a different kind of bacteria, which is also same for tuberculosis, um, mm-hmm. but it, it, it can stay dormant in your body for even 20 years. So nothing can happen for 20 years, and oh. then maybe after 20 years, you have signs of it. So this kind of a logic of the disease has not been discovered yet, and it's very difficult mm-hmm. also. Um, but uh, there, there is a cure, but because of the stigma, people would not come say that I have leprosy and I need help and I need treatment because they thought they will never see their families again if they own up that they have mm-hmm. leprosy. So that is why the, uh, the diagnosis took much longer. And when they came, they already had started getting deformities. If But now with awareness, this is kind of changing the situation. And so people come in at a much um, uh, a preliminary stage of the disease, mm-hmm. which is when you can actually treat it better and have better results and also um, have no visible signs of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of in a better position uh, now, but there's still, so up till now, I'm working with this uh, village in India called Anandwan, which was set up by um, a kind of saintly personality called uh, Baba Amte. Um, and he, uh, he just started it with his wife. He begged the government for a place and they gave him a wasteland where there was nothing and he uh, and his wife with their kids and who are very small and I think six leprosy patients they they kind of went there and they started so they did like they had to really dig up a well and like everything so um, that's how the journey began but now if you see the place it's like a complete success story and it's beautiful it has 
um, it's green and it's it's kind of grown into this really flourishing village. Mm -hmm. uh, though it started for people with leprosy to come and get treatment, um, now there are also people with disabilities with uh, older um, age uh, com communities as well. So it it when you're there, it looks um, all uh, very impressive. Mm -hmm. It is very impressive and now it's the third generation of the family which is kind of um, taking this work wow. ahead. But um, uh, they themselves they also say that the fact that Anandman exists means that there's something wrong with society. Otherwise you wouldn't That's need true. such a place to exist. Mm -hmm. And it, like it has grown, it's good that there is a place for people who are outcast from society. But the, the fact still remains that they are outcast from society. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, how uh, so ideally it should be that this place doesn't exist. Um, but it's not so easy to do as well. So I am um, trying to see where to just start a dialogue. And now that the medically the people with leprosy are taken care of and those awareness has been increased, treatment is good. Um, they have a self-sustaining lifestyle, they don't, I mean, in Anandwan nobody ever had to beg. It was a different story than the leprosy colonies that they were, uh, they found ways of um, earning their livelihood. Uh, so they have, um, they do agriculture, they have a dairy, they, um, they have a handloom center, they do a lot of crafts and um, yeah, it's, it's a huge uh, setup, um, but it's still the work, the link between them and the outside world, like the people outside the village, this link still, mm -hmm. there's a big gap. Mm -hmm. So there's no uh, exchange happening there or there's no, um, yeah, talks about how to actually bridge this gap. And that's where I'm hoping to uh, start a dialogue because to make a contribution, I think it will be still a long, longer term project. But at least if we are able to f uh, locate what, what are the issues where this gap needs to be filled. Mm -hmm. um, and then identify those external stakeholders, bring them on board, start a dialogue with the people residing in Anandwan. Then we can maybe think of a solution together. That's where I'm at in the project. <laughs> That's your noble yeah. goal. <laughs> wow, this is so powerful. I, I wish you most of the success with <laughs> with this endeavor. This is huge and so, so important. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing all this. <laughs> Janavi, my next question is about the flexible intersubjective centers of understanding mm -hmm. that I heard about from one of your presentations and I wanted to, to discuss these things with you. So as uh, members of society, we do have, as you mentioned, we do have some responsibilities and some, some phrase we uh, grew up in. And do you mean that there is a way to shift that actually there is a possibility to, to be more open and how to be more open towards other society mm -hmm. members? So what's your intake on that? Yeah, yeah, so I I was really fascinated when I came about this concept from, again, Delis and Guattari, uh -huh. um, uh, about, they speak about concepts as um, centers of vibrations. So they are not, um, concepts are not always like defined and uh, fixed. Their meaning is not fixed, that's what... Um, that's how I understand this. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, co the concepts don't correspond, but they cohere in a space. So for example, if one concept actually shifts its meaning, then all the other concepts, because they are cohering together, mm -hmm. they also have to shift their um, meanings a little bit to make this kind of frame. Mm -hmm. um, or to kind of fit together in a way. So um, I was, yeah, I, as I said, you know, I was really intrigued by this and I thought that what if we talk about 
the human being, we again, as we, uh, as I said earlier, we grow up with these uh, set understandings. Um, we set goals for our lives. We decide how we want to lead our life. What are the values that we want uh, that we have here in this life? Um, of course, they shift a little bit, mm -hmm. but we're always scared to kind of really make changes or leaps. Um, things become very habitual very easily. So um, I was thinking of what if we understand human beings not as um, self-defined delineated packages where they're like mm -hmm. kind of, you know, fixed and closed. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, like, you know, tied with a ribbon and uh -huh. fixed <laughs> like this, but, um, but as centers of vibrations. So this, again, I like the dynamism in it. I mm -hmm. think also coming from dance, this attracts me a lot. Um, and I feel like, again, to define a human being in terms of social sculpture, it comes closer about how do we understand a human being. And this, I think if we, again, when we judge other people, we're already putting them in boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are these delineated packages that I'm talking about. And if, um, if we don't think of people in these boxes, if they're actually as centers of vibration. So what um, in you vibrates and creates a resonance in me mm -hmm. with my vibrations, mm -hmm. so to say. Uh, and that can be an entry point. That's uh, a beautiful concept. I'm thinking about so, it right now. It's already an art form. Yes. So I think it's very artistic, very mm -hmm. aesthetic as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, very dynamic. A lot of fun, I think it could be to, to relate to other people in this way uh, because then it, it instantly opens up a curiosity uh, for the other person because you don't know what, how this person vibrates, what creates these vibrations, what is the inner motivation of this person, uh, where is this coming from. Mm -hmm. All of these questions kind of suddenly find um, space. Um, and they're not kind of closed off because you think this person is like this. Um, mm -hmm. So again, it's a way of um, avoiding uh, judgment in a way that that blocks our connection to another person. Uh, and these judgments often result in when they become habitual, they become biases, they become prejudices, um, they become stigma. Um, so it's not even about a person you know, but it's about, suddenly becomes about a group of people that you've never seen. Um, so like people with leprosy, they're all, they all have sinned and that is how they got this disease. That's the hmm. most popular narrative. To ease you on the road. Yes. So it's, um, but actually if you take the responsibility to mm -hmm. find this kind of vibration of, um, of a person, you know, how, how is this person functioning and throbbing and it's a life form and you are a life form and how is this actually um, connecting you to what could be the vibrations, what could be the resonances. Um, so that's where I think I'm going with this um, uh, idea borrowed from Deleuze and Quattari. I th I'm not sure what philosophers would have to say about me freely adopting this <laughs> idea from them. <laughs> Um, but for now, it works for my artistic um, approach. So it leads us pretty much to exploring and understanding the transformative potential of art and how can it influence um, relationships between people and aspects of inclusion, empathy and respect to conclude our talk mm -hmm. today. So it's, uh, well, mainly, like I said, you know, I'm borrowing, borrowing from uh, the social sculpture minds, uh, Boys and Shelley, this idea of imagination as the, as the workspace, you know, like as the primary workspace. And coming from philosophy, it was also quite hard for me to accept this, mm -hmm. uh, because in philosophy, you have rational thought above imagination. And... Um, so to treat imagination as the primary workspace um, is a challenge. It's easier said than done and it can be very vague and abstract. Um, for people, it's also very scary 
uh, to indulge your imagination because we're always taught with our conditionings to not um, go with this impulse. Um, so I think uh, that is kind of uh, where things start getting artistic. Um, and that's also the connection about how we can see social sculpture or um, whatever I'm trying to do in this field as an artwork. Um, because we, I'm working with my own uh, space of the imagination and trying to evoke uh, or trigger other people's imagination in a way. And then together we can find a suitable form, uh, which is what artists do, right? You, f you explore something together. In my case, it would be questions or um, attitudes and beliefs. And then we find uh, what emerges is a form, um, like a painting or drawing or a piece of piano. I don't know how, how you say this, uh, but um, yeah, or a choreography. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's it's similar. Uh, it maybe I won't employ music or dance or anything, and we come up with a completely different um, form. Uh, to do, uh, it, it actually depends on the participant. So uh, my role is, I see as a, a designer of these practices, mm -hmm. um, facilitating them as well, then researching my own practices and how, how they actually work in the field, um, observing, of course, what's uh, coming up. Um, and yeah, kind of this dual uh, one one foot in different uh, fields kind of artist philosopher artistic researcher <laughs> um, yeah always kind of uh, trying the balancing act um, because I think this it's a messy affair that I have uh, set up for myself and <laughs> it um, it requires this fluidity within myself to be able to uh, shift roles and change um, according to the situation and the people's um, demands. But I don't know if I'm answering what you said or I've gone on. on a, uh, no, I think you asked me. <laughs> I think you are shedding a lot of light and probably for a lot of viewers out there to to actually find out about this art form of social sculpture as an artwork. Thank you so much, Janavi. You are so brave and I wish you a lot of success with your extremely noble goals and your field work that's coming up mm -hmm. and all the future conferences and presentations. And I will be so excited to follow your, your work. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Alina. And thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, it, it's been great. Also, the to have time to chat with you <laughs> yes, for so finally. long. <laughs> finally. Yeah, yeah. and um, yes, it's it does require a lot of courage. So are you inviting me for this interview also means a lot. Uh, and the, like all kind of support is very welcome <laughs> and very much uh, needed as well. So yeah. The, the honor is Thank all you. mine. <laughs> and of course, uh, for the viewers out there, I'm sure it was super yeah. interesting and, and helpful. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you. <laughs> thank you, Janavi. And thanks everyone for watching till the end. Uh, check out the links below about Janavi's work and some references that she spoke about that we're going to provide. And I wish you all the best and see you in the next video. Bye everyone. Bye.